Thank you very much. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this interesting conference. So um, I will speak about a project that has started quite some, some while ago when I joined for some time the group of Marc Pelletier in, in Eindhoven. And as you see, so it's motivated from a biological problem, but it also leads to, as I think, quite interesting mathematical problems that I will uh, introduce here. Okay, so let me first show you the main object of interest. This is a cartoon of a, of a lipid bilayer, as you find it in cell membranes, as the main separating structures uh, you have there. So in, in real cell membranes, there are much more structure in, this, uh, in these layers, but the main building block is somehow what you, what you see here in these cartoons. So here you see it's... You have two sheets which come together and which are made of this, uh, this lipid molecules which you, which you see there. And it's quite remarkable. If you just throw enough of them in water, they will start to build structures, closed structures with such bilayers. Where does it come from? So these uh, lipid molecules are amphiphilic. So they have these two tails which, uh, which repel with, uh, with water. And they have these hats which are, uh, which are polar and do like contact with water. And organizing in such a structure just minimizes the contact between the tails, which are water repellent, and the water. So this is just the mechanism behind the formation of, uh, of such a structure. And um, so this is one interesting thing, the self-organization um, of these of this molecules, and you don't have any chemical bond between these this lipid molecules. They are free to move in plane, but nevertheless, the structures so, uh, show some solid-like behavior. So they resist stretching, they resist bending, uh, it's very difficult to rupture them. But on the other hand, you have this, this solid-like behavior that in plane, these uh, this lipids uh, can move quite freely. And as you, as you guess from this picture, here is some definite thickness of the structure, approximately twice uh, the length of such a lipid molecule. Okay, so these are, these are uh, lipid bilayers and a simple uh, representation here. As I said, life is much more complicated, but you also have artificial uh, vesicles, which are very much uh, made just of this lipid uh, molecules and look like this cartoon here. Okay, so there are quite some models around on different scales for, um, for such, uh, such bilayer membranes and for cell membranes. And so one question is how to explain the typical shapes you observe, like this typical shape of a red blood cell. We have this donut-like uh, like structure. And if you start on a micro scale, you maybe want to describe the positions of the lipid molecules or or so a certain group of lipid molecules that it's uh, very often done in molecular uh, dynamic simulations where you can really nicely see this self-organization uh, process but on the other hand it's very costly to um, to, to do simulations with, uh, with such micro scale models if you go on the on the other side and look at macro scale so you zoom out very much and then you would consider a cell membrane just as a, as a two-dimensional surface in space. And uh, starting in the, in the 70s, there were quite some proposals by biophysicists. They assign a shape energy to, um, to, to, uh, to, closed, to closed surfaces, and they argue that what you observe are somehow minima or local minima under several constraints of such a shape energy. So this takes now the name of Canham and Helfrich, such an energy. So you can, can have a sur surface tension term, but very often this is not present because uh, mainly the area is already fixed by the number of, of molecules uh, that form the, uh, the lipid bilayer. And then, so the next reasonable order due to some invariance you would like to have uh, is then a curvature energy. So it's a curvature energy. You could express it in this, this way. This is... Uh, so-called spontaneous curvature constant, which uh, expresses some, some, um, some non-symmetry between the outer and inner, and inner layer, and you have a Gaussian curvature term, depending where you look at your minimization problem, that might be just a constant uh, if you, for example, restrict to sphere-type uh, uh, surfaces. Okay, so this is uh, quite uh, successful in, in, in uh, explaining shapes that you really can, can observe. 
But on the other hand, you also put quite some, uh, some hypothesis already in that energy that you can't explain within that model. For example, you say everything is closed, everything carries a uniform density. And one goal is to come up with, a, with an, an energy which, uh, which maybe can help to justify this hypothesis you just put in as constraints in this macroscopic energy. So that's uh, the goal. So we start with a mesoscale energy, so some scale in between, and typically you have some mean field uh, type description. I put here a picture where you maybe pass to, uh, to concentration of, uh, of uh, tails and concentration of heads, and here are these red regions is where you have high concentration of tails, and you would maybe expect to see uh, such a configuration which uh, uh, high hat density outside and this tails, uh, tail density inside. So this is a kind of, uh, of model I will speak about, but there are recently also some very interesting other approaches to mesoscale models for such membranes. One by Benoit Merlet, who is in the audience, uh, who proposed a very interesting elasticity model with some anisotropy in this in-plane direction somehow. Okay, so let me now go to describe this, this model, which which uh, was first stated in that paper, but goes back to earlier proposals by, uh, by Marc Pelletier and all. I will present here is joint work with Marc Pelletier and Luca Lussardi. Okay, so this um, is this model which we, which we have introduced earlier. So we go to some idealized and rescaled densities of the tails and head particles. So this means we have assumed some strong repulsion, so you have no mixing. They only take maximal concentration or zero concentration. Then you have a, a condition which expresses that you have exclusive supports of both density, and then you fix the mass and you take some equal here. And this m there should be independent of epsilon, and this epsilon will play a role later uh, as a thickness of, uh, of the structures you merge. And then you propose this energy you find, you find here, where you have a, some of a surface area term of the support of this tail, par tail particles. Note that the jump is one over epsilon, so with this scaling here, it's, it's really the size of the boundary of the support. And this clearly comes from this repulsive effect between the tails and, and polar particles, so the heads and, and the water. So that's the mot motivation for, for that first term. And then you see a second term here, which is the Monge Kantorovich D1 distance. So we have heard uh, about uh, the D2 distance uh, uh, yesterday quite a lot. So here you have a cost which is given over the integral how much mass have you moved and not the square of the distance as before, but now the distance you have, uh, you have traveled uh, uh, itself. And uh, there's some reason why the mathematical analysis works with this one, even if this might not be the best uh, choice from the, from the point of, uh, of the model. So this comes not uh, just from, 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 from nowhere. So this was formally derived from a, from a microscale model and an upscaling procedure, and, and then it comes up this energy here, which, uh, which is quite interesting for several reasons. So you see some relation to what we have seen yesterday in Mateo Novaga's talk. So you have here a perimeter term and some interaction term be between the two phases. So this is somehow similar also to, to models for block uh, copolymers. But here you have not that everything is filled by two phases. You have also void space, but also therefore uh, you have some, some models which are quite of similar type, but with a d1 distance replaced by, uh, by the h minus 1 distance. So this fits into this framework somehow, and there's quite some interest in understanding uh, such energies as we see here. Yes, there you see the, uh, the energy again, and if you look at both terms, they are competing. So the first term would like everything to concentrate in a ball, because you would like to, to minimize the perimeter, and then the V would probably go outside, and the second term, and the second term it uh, prefers that you have maximal, maximal mixing of the both structures. So they are really, uh, really competing with this, uh, this both terms. And uh, so it's interesting, what, what does this energy prefer for structures? So as you see, we, we don't restrict from the beginning to any particular structure. 
So we would like to see a preference for a certain structure and a preference for, for bilayer uh, type structures. So this is really what we would like, uh, what we would like to, to, to show here. So in this rescaling, it's interesting. So it's this, um, so epsilon should be a small parameter. So it's interesting to, be, to understand the behavior of this energy. So what structures are preferred for, for small epsilon. And then one way to understand this better is to, to study the limit. Uh, epsilon to zero, uh, best in a way of gamma convergence of such, uh, such energies uh, if, uh, if that is possible. And this would make a connection to a macro scale, so where you really uh, concentrate on, uh, on the measures. Remember that we scale the density with 1 over epsilon, but keep the mass fixed. So, so these uh, um, this concentrations, they have, to, they have to concentrate on a measure. And you would like to see that what's coming up for good structures is that they concentrate on surfaces and that you maybe get out of this energy in the asymptotic limit of curvature energy. And, and this is all about what, what I would will I speak here. And what would be nice if this implicit assumption you put in that macro scale model, if, data, if these are coming out here from, from the asymptotic analysis as constraints. And uh, so um, to, to introduce um, the results, I need to, to give some, uh, some information on this associated transport problem. So this D1 term you sh you sh you've seen in the, in the energy. And uh, so if you think of the model, so what, what is kind of strange, we don't, uh, we don't account that there's a connection between heads and tails in, in, in that model. So we have density of tails, density of heads. And this distance term, this is somewhat implicit uh, um, uh, account for, for, this, for this, this, uh, this connection. So you penalize somehow distances uh, by this term, and then this is, this is where this comes from if you, if you take your, uh, your uh, microscale model and, and scale this up. So this one dis D1 distance is now that you take the infimum of a transport uh, maps that we have seen yesterday, but not now of the square of the distance you have traveled, but about uh, the distance itself. So this at first place is, uh, is less nice because now your cost here is not any more strictly convex, which you see here. And this causes some troubles if you would like to, to prove uh, existence of a transport map. But nevertheless, for reasons we will see later, this is here, uh, here uh, the bad, so the easier choice, so to say. You have also a dual formulation, so you get uh, the same the same uh, cost, the same value, if you take the supremum about our Lipschitz function, which Lipschitz constant one of, uh, of this expression here, that's exactly the dual formulation. And there's quite some things known about this transport problems. In particular, since we have here densities which have uh, Lebesgue density, uh, you know that there exists by work of Caffarelli, Feldman, McKen. And by many others who have worked on the subject, there exists an optimal transport uh, map, there exists an optimal Kantorovich potential, and they have quite some interesting properties. So transport here is a long race, so you can identify rays which are maximal uh, line segments where the Kantorovich potential phi really has slope one, and then points on this ray are transported to the, to the same ray. And this is a very uh, nice property that somehow your, your domain splits into, into this transport rays. And we make uh, heavily use of this property and that's why we have to choose the D1 distance and don't know how to proceed with D2, even if we have some reason to believe that there is a similar behavior if you would exchange D1 by D2. Another nice property is here, rays can only intersect in common endpoints. So you have no crossings uh, of this rays uh, in the inside. And so you have a kind of picture like this. So this is part of your structure, which you would expect, which you don't prescribe, but we would expect. And then in a generic situation, you have this rays, and you have somehow uh, a foliation of the support of the measures uh, by, by this rays. Have a certain length if you would like to to uh, to describe the support, and and these are very much the way how we uh, how we express 
in, sp in particular this uh, d1 distance term later when we uh, will pass to a limit. Okay, so what are previous results in this particular uh, so joint work with, with Marc Pelletier in 2009? So we have a, a lower bound, and maybe let me state it here in this informal way and later I'll give you, uh, I'll give you more details. So you see that you can bound the energy from below by twice the mass, and then you have uh, more positive terms, non-negative terms. One term penalizes the deviation from uniform thickness of the structure, and the thickness is even uh, <coughs> close to epsilon, the structure, or to epsilon, I should say. And the second term, which penalizes the deviation of these ray directions from the normal directions of these boundary curves of the, of the U epsilon support. And then on, an, on, an, on a level with scale epsilon square, you find that, that there pops up an, an, uh, an curvature energy or an approximation of a curvature energy uh, which you find there. And what we have done, and this is now really in, so this previous work is in, is in 2D only, but there we really get a, a quite, quite sharp, sharp result. So in two dimensions, you have gamma convergence of the rescaled functional where you subtract the 2m and scale by epsilon uh, to the power minus 2. So you really would like to see this part, this part here of the, uh, of the energy. You have gamma convergence of this functional to a generalized elastica functional. What does it mean? So if you have good, uh, good energy structures in the sense that this, this value here remains, uh, remains bounded, and you pass to a limit, then the density, the density concentrates on uh, a family of W22 curves, and the energy which count is, is just uh, uh, the kappa square, the curvature square, integrated over this uh, system of curves. You have some additional properties which you find there. So the concentration of this measure on this curve is with uniform, with uniform thickness which is even since you have this bilayer structure, so there are always two curves coming, uh, coming together somehow. They can touch, but they cannot cross the system of curves. And uh, you have no open ends in the structures. So this is, uh, this is somehow a very, uh, very clear result since you have this, um, this uh, gamma convergence framework which applies here. And as you see, you have some of this, some of this implicit assumption in your Marcus model. You have to, uh, in fact, uh, validated here, this uniform thickness and, uh, and no crossing, for example, and no open ends. So this is a 2D thing, and this works out very nicely. And uh, what we meanwhile can do is we can also do something in 3D, and that's uh, what I would like to talk about here. Okay, so what about uh, three space dimension? And uh, this is a work from last year with Luca Lusardi from Brescia, and, uh, and Marc Pelletier. And there we could also in 3D proof uh, a lower bound in the spirit that I've shown you informally on the last slide and I will speak about uh, that in more detail below. And we have formally could identify a limit energy. So what was played before by the Elastica functional in 2D, this role is now taken by this curvature energy which you see there, this combination of mean curvature and, and Gaussian curvature, which you see there. And then you can convince yourself that this here is a positive quadratic form in the principal curvatures, uh, which you have here. So that comes of this particular combination of constants if you, uh, if you consider the limit of, uh, of this model. So what could we uh, really prove? This identification, as I said, is formal, was formal, but then we could at least do the limb sub estimate for for the gamma convergence results. So if you start with a nice smooth boundary of a set which has the right mass, and since everything comes with, with two sheets, the right mass is, is uh, one half m, then you find an approximation of uh, such uh, function satisfying the constraints before, such that uh, the tails, also the v epsilon, would concentrate uh, on the surfaces with uh, uniform density, density two and such that this rescaled energy uh, converges to twice this curvature energy there. Okay, so this is this uh, limb sum estimate. So here uh, the construction is maybe as you would, would try to do it. You take parallel surfaces from there and then you have to be a bit careful how you, 
how you place these parallel surfaces, uh, but more or less that's, uh, that's not too difficult to, uh, to get this, uh, this limbs up uh, uh, construction there. So more interested is to how to produce this uh, just general lower bound and, and uh, that we will see uh, later. Okay, in a, in a more recent work, which is just a preprint at the moment, uh, we uh, look at the compactness and, uh, and lower bound estimate. Um, and here we, we have to pass to a simplified setting. So the, the, full, uh, so the full problem is still too hard, but for that we get some compactness for small energy structures so that you have a bound on this rescaled energy. Uh, we come up with a generalized formulation of the limit energy and can then really prove some lower bound uh, if you pass with approximations and this energy to the limit. Okay, let me first speak about this, uh, this lower bound, uh, which I've shown you before, uh, how the character of this lower bound is and how to ob uh, obtain it here. Okay, first of all, so the configurations we are looking at is one the set where the tail density uh, lifts and then the boundary curves of this uh, of the set of, uh, of support. And uh, so for, you can smooth out it a bit and it's, it's no uh, restriction if you assume that you have their nice smooth uh, surfaces that bound this, uh, this uh, set you, uh, you epsilon. And then you fix a uh, smooth inner unit normal field, uh, new epsilon, and this describes uh, the configurations we would look at. Now from the uh, optimal transport problems, there comes more uh, geometric information into play here. So we have a direction field on that surfaces, and this is just the direction of the rays crossing boundary points. So this gives you a unit, a unit vector field on this boundary curves uh, uh, <coughs> of these boundary curves, and uh, this is given even by the gradient of the of the Cantorovic potential. And uh, then to describe the situation, you have to see how how much how far you go on that race, uh, how far your support goes, and, uh, and there you have to be a bit careful. It could be that a ray crosses several times the boundary, and then you have to count uh, only parts of the uh, of the ray. Uh, assigned to a certain, to a certain point. And then what plays a major role is the mass sitting over, sitting over a point. And with these quantities here, um, you can, and, and these properties of the, uh, of the mass transport, you can, uh, uh, you can give a parameterization of your support and you can compute how this transport term in particular looks like. We've seen that already, strange, okay. So here's again this, uh, this picture we have seen before with that, with that race there. And now you set up a parameterization. So you take a point on, on this boundary curve and you go in direction of this race. And this is a parameterization in particular because of this property uh, that rays only intersect in common endpoints. I mean, there's quite some things to, to be shown, but this, this works as a nice uh, parameterization, what you, what you have there. In particular, this uh, theta, this is countable ellipsis, and so you can make sense of, uh, of the Jacobian of this uh, parameterization psi. And there you see that you get something where derivatives uh, of theta uh, turn, turns up. And you find this combination there if you look at the Jacobian. Oh, sorry, ES, so this is somehow a set of good boundary points because at some points the transport goes in the wrong direction and you should not uh, parameterize over that point. You have also to, to uh, otherwise you would, you would cover certain pieces twice. Uh, okay. So it's a s subset of the boundary points, of the boundary points in particular where uh, where the boundary passes inside array, and uh, so you have some some s good subset where you uh, only need, or we, we, we only you should only restrict to such points when parameterizing the support. Okay, but this could be of a positive area inside the sigma v, right? Sorry, this. This uh, e of s could be uh, the complement of the good set could be of positive area inside the sigma. That that could that could be. 
yeah, it could be. If you have some ring structures where the rays are really co uh, crossing several times the boundary, then it might be that that at one boundary curve you transport in the wrong direction. You don't want to parameterize over such points. Okay. But this works works out. So. Okay, and if you now uh, so this d theta, so the the uh, the transport so the theta the transport direction is constant on the rays. So you always have to is that d theta times theta is zero. So you have, uh, in particular, for this d theta, which is a symmetric uh, matrix, you have one eigenvalue zero. And if you denote the other eigenvalues by lambda one, lambda two, then you can express, uh, express this term there, this Jacobian there, in terms of, of these eigenvalues. And what you introduce here now is a mass sitting over a point, which is somehow the integral in the t direction up to your effective length if you have to consider when, um, when parameterizing the support. And then you find, find this expression here and you see now we are going into a direction where we have, uh, have a form on the, in the uh, eigenvalues of this d, d theta uh, matrix. Okay, so uh, how to produce this, this lower bound? I don't want to go into, into much details here. So what you do, what is convenient here is to do a change of uh, variables. Instead, taking length variables on the race, you take mass variables. We will we'll see uh, at what point, at what length uh, have you uh, sitting how much mass on that, uh, on that, uh, on that race. This gives you this... Uh, this uh, transformation MP and the inverse of this transformation is TP. Then you can estimate the distance. So you have made this change of variables here. So you integrate to some to the to the total effective uh, mass on that thing, and then you have here the point X. So this is the point X you have here. You have here where it's transported to. So you, you see here the expression from the uh, from the distance term. Uh, and, and now what's this nice properties in this mass variables, what you find there for P fixed, that this again can be expressed as a, the optimal mass transport problem. So your, your mass transport problem splits into a lot of mass transport problems which are one dimensional and where, which are on the race. And then it's, it's easy to estimate this. And here you really estimate distance, so this t variable uh, expresses uh, um, the distances here, and you have this estimate there. And, and here it's really crucial that you have this d1 thing. So this splitting into one-dimensional transport problems, it's not true for, uh, for, for, for other uh, Wasserstein distances than the, the d2. The second ingredient is that you really can express uh, quite explicitly this, this uh, t, this, uh, this uh, inverse transformation of the mass, and you can show by Taylor expansion that you have an estimate uh, like this here. And now you guess already here, this looks like 1 over 4 h square minus 1 over 6 uh, uh, Gaussian curvature. And in fact, what you, what you get, if you put everything together, is an estimate uh, like this. So now comes also the, the area term there, and then you have an estimate by two, twice the mass. Then you have this deviation from uniform mass. It's here, but this translates also in, in first order to uniform distance, what you have there. So you have this term that, that you have a penalization of a non-uniform distance. The second term there, theta is the ray direction, nu is the inner normal. So it penalizes if they don't have the same direction, uh, the second term there. And finally, on an epsilon square level, you have this combination. Then you have a quadratic form in, uh, in d theta. And, and this is just given by this formula, which we somehow have seen, seen before uh, coming out from this, uh, from this um, computer estimates for, for the distance terms. So if you diagonalize A, which is possible in our case since it's symmetric, we have one degenerate di direction, so we have one eigenvalue uh, zero, two other eigenvalues lambda one two, and then this quadratic form is just given as here. In particular, you see that you that you yield bound uh, the eigenvalues itself, so you have really control over uh, the norm square of d theta. Okay, so this is uh, the lower lower bound. And now we would like to use this lower bound to, uh, to, to pass to a limit. And there we face, uh, 
face certain difficulties. So first difficulties, if you, if you now think of this term on order epsilon square, you have some bound on d theta, but in front you have this total mass on that ray, which is close to one, if you do on this, the scaling with, with uh, epsilon to minus two, it's, it, in most places it's close to one, but still it could in some places uh, go down to zero. And, uh, and so this estimate, it's not clear how much, uh, how much it, it, it helps. The other difficulty is you would like to make a connection with, uh, with, with the curvature energy. So how can you make this, this connection? So just formally, the first, uh, the second term tells you that an epsilon in the limit should, should be close to one. That theta epsilon, the third term tells you should be close to the normal. Okay, if you just replace d theta epsilon by nu, so you would formally expect that you get the same quadratic form on uh, d nu, but this is exactly this curvature energy we have seen before. So formally we see how this curvature energy is coming, but I mean here we have really an energy on, not on d nu, but we have this deviation still in the direction. So it's not the, it's not the, deri uh, the, 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 made, the derivative of the normal which we control, but only of this theta epsilon, which, uh, which is not clear how much it, it tells you. So and this is now the question we would like to address. So we somehow uh, look only at one of the two problems which, which are inside here if we would like to, to pass to a limit. So we, uh, we assume now that the mass is everywhere, this m epsilon is everywhere one, and only deal with the problem that you have, that you have a, a quadratic form and the derivatives of theta, but the theta is not really your normal direction, but only close to that normal. So this is now what we would look, uh, like to look at. And this is a simplified problem where, you, where we, uh, we would like to do something. Okay, so, uh, so here's the, the problem formulations. So we consider tuples given by, by surfaces, nice surfaces, and uh, at least Lipschitz, uh, direction field on that, uh, on that surface is of unit length with the property that, uh, that you always are pointing the same half space at this uh, inner normal. And then we, we now, before we had started with, an, with a field which is somehow given in the ambient space, now we start with a field which is just given of the surface. It's convenient to extend the, uh, the differential d theta to extend uh, this to a map from R3 to R3, but by uh, setting uh, it in direction of theta to zero, that's exactly what we had before. D theta applied to theta was, was zero before because it was constant in the ray direction, and also that uh, this LP is symmetric. And then the energy we are interested in is given by this quadratic form evaluated at this matrix, uh, at the matrix L. And then a term which expresses that your direction should be close to, to the normal direction, but could possibly deviate on a certain scale. Okay, and now the question is, can we pass to a limit with, uh, uh, with a sequence of uh, uniformly bounded with respect to this Q epsilon and the surface measure uh, and discover that you go to that direction where the situation where really the theta becomes the normal direction. So somehow that, <coughs> that, that you really uh, have this, this is small perturbation under this condition of your, uh, of your curvature energy. Okay, this should be also quite of interest in other things where you just have a director field given on a surface uh, but it's not that, that clean situation of di uh, differential geometry that is exactly normal, but it's only approximately normal. And, and then what can you say about energies uh, of this type here? Okay, so the result we would, uh, would like to prove is, so if we have uh, infinitesimal sequences, epsilon j going to zero and have a sequence of such pairs of surfaces uh, equipped with a director field, and if you have the property that, that uh, uh, 
that the surface area of the surface is just uniformly bounded and this curvature energy that is also uh, uniformly bounded that you have no problems with stuff going outside uh, going to, to infinity uh, and uh, since you have uniformly bounded area so the uh, the host of measure, measure restricted to the surface which would con will converge to some Radon measure as j to infinity and then what we claim is that that this mu is in fact better than that's just the measure it's an integral variable with generalized uh, second fundamental form in the sense of Hutchinson and uh, then you have, when you have a second fundamental form you can express mean curvature square and and the Gaussian curvature and that for this functional here so our curvature energy there you find uh, this lower bound estimate uh, would like to obtain. Let me just mention that uh, that the limb sub estimate I've stated before gives also a limb sub estimate for for this convergence in this particular situation here since uh, uh, the sequence we have constructed in, in that paper satisfies that M is really exactly uh, one everywhere. So so the limb sub statement if you are thinking of, uh, of as the ultimate goal uh, having a gamma convergence result the limb sub statement uh, is done and, and this is somehow uh, some of the compactness and lower bound part. Okay, what are, what are the, the main difficulties here? So, um, I mean, even if you have uh, a bound uh, on, on the second fundamental form, it does not tell you, uh, even if, when you start with smooth surfaces, too much. So you will end up, if you pass to, to an arbitrary limit, some subclass of, uh, of Hutchinson variables with, uh, with L2 uh, second fundamental form but, uh, but you can have change of topology and, uh, and so it's, it's not that regular even in that case but now here in our case we do not control we do not control the curvature for the approximations we control the derivative of this uh, of this ray directions which is something different and uh, and you don't obtain from that that you uh, this from that for your approximation you have a control on second fundamental form or mean curvature. We could not even find a control on, on first variation. So this poses some problem. If you would like, maybe attack this uh, this problem by by using uh, very fault compactness. Uh, then you typically need to. Uh, uh, to be able to pass to a limit some control on the first variation, but but this is not the case, uh, and this is, this is not the case here. So, so we got stuck at this point for quite some while, and looking at the 2D analysis, that's not very very helpful, uh, because what we did there is we uh, we passed from the original curves to modified curves, which had this ray directions in fact really as as their as their normal. So that's easy in, two, uh, in 2D to, to, uh, to do such a construction and to control such a construction. But, uh, but this is, I don't think that this works uh, in 2D that from the normal, you, from, from the theta you produce a new surface that the theta becomes really a normal. So, uh, so this is not very helpful. Also in, in 2D that could be in another way where you make some somehow this argument with control on first variation uh, uh, working, but, but this does not work in, in 3D. So, so now you have to, to really do something else. And then at some point, uh, we discovered this concept of generalized Gauss graphs, and this turned out to be, to be a much better tool uh, uh, and concept here. So what you do there is you look at the, at the graphs of your of your uh, of your ray of your, of your of your ray field uh, theta j over the s j, and you make uh, make uh, out of them a, a current. I will tell you about later, and this is inspired by the theory of uh, of generalized Gauss graphs, which was introduced by Ancelotti, Serapioni, and Tamanini in the 90s, and then developed uh, very much further by Deladio in the 90s and and uh, in the 2000 years. And it turns out that we can use this technique, and that is, this is quite stable under this, uh, under this um, perturbation in the, in the normal direction. So the idea is just here you take the graph of the normal, 
Instead, now we're taking the graph over this, this, uh, this ray directions uh, there. Okay, what are, what are these uh, this generalized Gauss graphs? So let's start with a, with a smooth surface uh, S and a smooth normal field nu. Then look at, uh, at the graph. So given by this graph function assigning to a point the tuple P and, uh, and the normal in that point. And uh, so it's convenient to distinguish in the following the space where, where uh, the surface lifts and where the image of the Gauss uh, graph uh, of, of, the, uh, of the Gauss map lives, and this is this uh, notation R3x and R3y uh, that, I'm, that I'm using there. Okay, then you have your normal. You take an, uh, an, an two-form, two-vector field, uh, which, uh, which describes uh, uh, the orthogonal uh, space to that normal, and then with, with, your, with your phi, you push forward this uh, uh, this uh, two vector field to a two vector field on the graph. That's what you're doing there. So you have a simple vector, and then you can uh, can can show that you can normalize it to to a unit uh, simple vector uh, field. So and this is what what is called an orientation. And with the help of this orientation, you can now define a, a current. So this is an object which has a supporting supporting a set, which is, uh, which is an, as a, as a graph here. You have a, a, a multiplicity function, which if you start with a classical Gauss graph is just one, but you could, uh, but you will replace it later by a general integer function, and by an orientation field, and then you can, can uh, integrate two differential forms uh, by applying then pointwise this form to that, uh, to that orientation at that point. Okay, this is in the, in the, in the smooth case, how you make out of a surface uh, such a current on the, on the Gauss graphs. And uh, now you generalize this, uh, these people generalize this, so you, you give up that the G is coming really from, uh, from a smooth surface and, uh, and a smooth normal map, so it's just an, an H2 rectifiable set in R3x cross R3y. You have an integer multiplicity density function, and you have an, an orientation there, and uh, and you demand certain additional properties which make it like classical Gauss graphs, and uh, in particular, what you say so your your G's should be supported on R3x cross the S2, so that you have uh, some unit lengths in uh, in the Y component, and uh, that the uh, set perpendicular, so if you look at the orientation eta xy, that's uh, uh, the enveloping subspace uh, of this two-vector form, that this is perpendicular to y. So this is what is clearly satisfied for classical Gauss graph, and this you, you, uh, you ask here for generalized Gauss graph to be satisfied, and then to fix whether you put uh, plus or minus eta x, you, uh, you have also a condition that fixes that, uh, that orientation. Okay. I, don't want to go into, into details here, but this is a general idea. And uh, if you have such a sequence of, uh, of classical Gauss graph passed to the limit, then certainly they, it's made like this, they satisfy these properties there. But uh, as far as I know, it's not clear that the properties posed here are really uh, exactly that you can approximate every generalized Gauss graph by such smooth Gauss graph. OK, but this uh, does not hurt us here uh, very much. OK, what are, why, are this, why is this concept uh, nice for it? Because you have a nice, uh, nice device for compactness, the Federer Fleming compactness theorem uh, for, for currents. So if you have such an, uh, such an rectifiable current, if you know that the boundary is a rectifiable current too, and the mass of both is uniformly controlled, then you get some limit in, this, in the sense of currents. And, uh, and this is, in fact, uh, possible to achieve here under the conditions uh, if you have a curvature energy bounded, because curvature controls the mass of the, of the Gauss graph. So if you look at the Jacobian of this, uh, of this map phi, then it's quadratic in D nu. And, and so if you have a quadratic control on curvatures, uh, then you control this mass. 
So this is, gives you one of the, of the things you need for, for this compactness result there. And vice versa, the Gauss graphs allow to express, to express curvatures. So if you look at the stratification of your, uh, of your uh, field Xi, then uh, that means you split it into a component where you have the forms, uh, the vectors only in, uh, in the R3x part. So the mixed part R3x and R3y, this is epsilon j is the orthonormal basis in, in R3y, EI orthonormal basis in uh, the standard basis in, in R3x, and then the part where you, where you have both vectors in, uh, in R3y. And then you can see, if you choose uh, tau 1, tau 2, an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors quite easily that you get for this psi 1 in particular, these expressions where the uh, principal curvatures uh, pop up. And in particular, if you uh, take so the norm of C1 squared, you get kappa 1 squared plus kappa 2 squared. So this is uh, uh, the second fundamental form, form squared. So this, um, this helps you to express curvature also by, by this, or at least certain expressions of curvature by, uh, by these Gauss graphs. And then this is, uh, is promising for, for what we are doing here, but now we need to somehow do everything, not for this Gauss graphs, but for this, for this direction field graphs that we have there. So that's, that's the idea. So we formulated our final result in terms of, uh, of Hutchinson's curvature varifold. So, so what is this here? Let's, for motivation, start again from a smooth surface and then doing divergence formula on the surface and testing with a test vector field, which, which you take a function phi, which lives on a spatial component on a matrix, and you plug in there in the matrix components a projection onto the, the tangent, tangent space. And then you take the divergence formula, which is phi times as the ice, uh, uh, the ice uh, unit vector, and then you get this formula uh, here, what you find there. So this delta i being the ice component of the surface gradient uh, that, that you have there. And, and this is the motivation since uh, components of the second fundamental form can somehow expressed by derivatives of the, of the projection. This is um, the starting point to, to give a generalized concepts of second uh, fundamental form. So you say if you have a varifold, an integral two varifold V, that's a curvature varifold. If you find a V measurable function I, I, J, K, which just uh, generalize this derivatives of the projection such that you have the classical formula in this sense. And again, having this uh, A, I, J, K, you can express uh, functionals in the curvatures by, uh, by these components there. So again, this is, this allows them to, to, to formulate this, this limit function. Okay, so let me, since time is, uh, is running, uh, let me very briefly tell you some steps of, of, this, uh, of this compactness uh, proof. And, and the details are here uh, quite tedious in, in many aspects. Uh, okay, so uh, we start now with uh, a surface equipped with a direction field as we have fixed before. We look now not on the graph of the normal, but at the, on the graph of this, uh, of this direction field. And we make it uh, a current in, uh, uh, over these uh, this graphs, just similar in the way as we have, uh, we have seen before. And then the first thing you see is that the mass is, uh, is uniformly bounded by this functional and the curvature, uh, which, what we have there. Just by the same argument, so if you see the component, it's quadratic in d theta, but d theta, uh, so it's controlled by, by your, uh, by your functional, uh, functional q, so you have a control there. And now we're together with what we have assumed in the theorem, a uniform bond on the, uh, on the surface area and on this, uh, on this functional, uh, you have a uniform bound on, on the mass. You have also no problem with, with boundary. You start with something without boundary and your theta is smooth enough that your current uh, will have no boundary there. So in fact, here is a bit more precise estimate uh, here there for the Jacobian. Okay, then as before, you look at, uh, at the stratifications and, uh, and you can express the different uh, stratifications, psi zero, it's only depending 
on the, uh, on the underlying tangent space uh, of the surface S. And C1, there are derivatives appearing of the d theta. If you now develop this in the uh, in a standard basis uh, of the vectors uh, in R3x cross R3y, then you find for this representing matrix uh, this formula there. And uh, yeah, what you find is this is one here again. So if vk, these are the, uh, these are the eigenvectors of this, uh, of this map L. So in the classical Gauss graph case, they would be just orthonormal to, to, to new, and you have the old formula here, and, and now you have, have, uh, uh, have this formula here with this, with this extra uh, effect for, from the deviation there. Okay, then you get this convergence uh, as currents, basically from, from, this, uh, from this bound that we have before, and uh, what will play a, a role later is that, uh, that you look at, at this uh, Radon measures where you just take this, this zero stratification, which also is uh, the inverse of the Jacobian of the projection of the, uh, of the parameterization. So it basically brings you back to the, uh, to the surfaces S, what you have there. And you have all the convergence of, of this Radon measure to the corresponding Radon measure of, uh, the, li of the limit current T. Um, which is uh, it's given by this underlying set G density beta and orientation eta. Okay, then you have this perpendicular property, which I have not formulated before, because now we would like to show that in the limit we are a Gauss graph. The so approximations they are not Gauss graphs, but we would like in the limit that we have a Gauss graph there, and the condition is just that what you see on the left hand side there in this aligned equation that this should, should be zero. And for the approximations, you can compute this expression. And uh, what you find that it's not zero, but with y becoming the normal direction, um, this uh, would be zero. And you have a control on this deviation. So y plays the role of the theta. So you have a control of this deviation there. And this tells you that passing to a limit, passing to a limit, you obtain this orthogonality property. This condition theta times new larger zero, which we have uh, uh, posed before, this fixes orientation, uh, passing from to minus orientation you have choosing. So this uh, shows that the conditions uh, are satisfied and you really have in the limit uh, a generalized Gauss graph. What you now need to do is to reformulate your, your energy, which we have defined on, uh, on S and theta in terms of the, in terms of the Gauss graph. And, um, and that you can do, and you can reformulate your energy, which, which we would like to express in, in a form that's, that's given where. So this prefactor is a good factor, somewhat is, and, and then where before there was a function of d theta, there now you have a function of this, uh, of this first stratifications. This is uh, what we have seen before as, as psi one. So uh, this translates to this form, and, uh, okay, I, I skip all, all details there, but this Fy, this is uh, nothing but a quadratic form, and you can express it if you just, all your components of eta1 over eta0, uh, put them in a, uh, in a vector just by, by, uh, uh, <coughs> by a quadratic form on R, R9. What we now need is for this function Fy that we have good convexity and, and growth properties. And that's from the beginning not the case. So that's first not the case, but you can, uh, can uh, collect quite some information. So the first line is just repeating uh, our reformulation. And then from the special structure of uh, the approximation, you get some additional properties. So so uh, we have certain relation between the psi one and, and the theta, and this helps to rule out bad directions, some of your, of your quadratic form that, that you have there. Looking at this IY, what, which, uh, which was describing the, the quadratic form, you find that you have an eigenvalue minus one, which is certainly bad uh, for convexity. You have uh, zero eigenvalues and, uh, and good eigenvalues. But now this one, is ruled out by this condition, also quite some of the directions in the zeros eigenspace are ruled out and the others are small. 
So and this helps you to be able to modify your energy in such a way that, uh, that you have something uh, which has good convexity and growth properties uh, which, uh, and that you can pass to a limit there. Okay, so just, uh, just uh, how does it proceed? So we modify this energy, then we can apply to this uh, measures Tj0, which basically project everything down, and this, uh, this fields Xi1. We can then apply uh, a compactness and lower semi-continuity properties by Hutchinson theory of measure function pairs, so we get something here together with an, a limit there together with an, with, an, with an lower bound estimate. And now what we have to do, we need one <coughs> important property that uh, you have some absolute continuity of this, uh, of this C1 part, this T1, uh, with respect to this T0. And, uh, and then you, get, you can reformulate your, uh, your lower bound estimate uh, in this way. And now you have to go, to go back this process. Now we have this, uh, this functional given in terms of this Fy, and now you would like to come back to formulations uh, on the Gauss graph, and this is given here. And under this condition, which, which uh, this absolutely continuity property, this results by Deladio, that in this case, this generalized Gauss graph uh, can be, uh, there can be assigned a very fold to that thing, which is a, a curvature very fold in Hutchinson's sense. And then again, then again, you can uh, reformulate the energy which you got for, for the Gauss graphs in terms of this curvature very folds. And that's basically our formulation, which you find here in, in terms of Hutchinson's very folds uh, of the limit energy, which you have there. Last step is that your measure mu is just uh, the mass measure of that very fold, uh, which, uh, which comes from this current T, and, uh, and this finishes, uh, finishes the arguments. Okay, and with this uh, slide we're finished, and I thank you for your attention.